KMCV News is coming your way in a matter of minutes. Here's a quick look at what we've been working on all day. The parties involved with the Article 12 suit against the Nico Hotel speaks out about this week's court proceedings. And the Commonwealth Utilities Corporation could be facing a class action suit from hundreds of disgruntled customers for allegedly improperly disconnecting their power. And Nick Sablon goes for, from being a million dollar man to a ten thousand dollar man as his bail is slashed after allegedly threatening a local judge. All of that plus much more next on KMCB News. Good evening and welcome to the Friday cast of KMCB News. I'm Glenn Wakai. Thanks for joining us this evening. I'm Nanette Miranda. We'll have weather and sports in just a few minutes. But first, topping our news this evening. It's a $700,000 land lease that has landed in court. For two years, the Hotel Nikko Saipan has been battling the original landowners. The Nikko and its parent company, Japan Airlines, have threatened to fly out of the Commonwealth should they lose that fight. This past week, the case moved one step towards a verdict. This 60 to $100 million building sits precariously in San Roque. Three family members hold the title to the property. However, a silent sibling made a loud statement in court this past week. The Carl Smith Law Firm presented evidence that one of the three family members doesn't support the litigation his sisters are pursuing. Attorney Marcia Schultz showed the court a 55-year lease Edward Camacho signed with the NICO in 1991. Attorney Ted Mitchell is representing the two plaintiffs, Teresita De La Cruz and Estefania Chong. He was surprised by the document. Schultz says the NICO wasn't trying to hide the lease agreement. In 1991, the judge ordered Mitchell to bring Camacho into the case. Schultz says Mitchell only made contact with Camacho last month and that it was an appropriate time to present the NICO Camacho lease. Mitchell says the agreement will have no effect on the outcome of the case. In another surprise move, Schultz filed a counterclaim which would allow restitution should the plaintiffs win the case. Mitchell says that counterclaim should have been made two years ago and speculates on why Judge Castro allowed the counterclaim. But in order for the Nico Hotel not to suffer because of the mistakes of their own lawyers, the, uh, they got, the judge allowed the counterclaim in. So all of, this, all of this great screaming and yelling that Nico Hotel has been making about uh, how they're going to lose their hotel and dynamite it and walk off and leave us all alone here uh, has to be seen against the background of this litigation. They never ask for it. Mitchell feels the granting of the counterclaim changes the complexion of the case. He says that Nico no longer has to continue to, in his words, blackmail the Commonwealth with its threats of departure. Either the plaintiffs, if they prevail on the Article 12 claim, the plaintiffs will have to buy the hotel from the NICO, or the Carl Smith lawyers will have to pay NICO. Schultz says the Carl Smith law firm has no responsibility for the 60 to $100 million restitution. If the plaintiffs win and are forced to pay the counterclaim, Mitchell says he would request a special arrangement. What we would then ask the judge to do is set up an arrangement whereby the sisters would get the hotel and pay for the, call, the value of the hotel in installments out of the revenue from the hotel. And the only sensible, logical thing is for those sisters, our clients, to lease to Nico. President Kitajima of the Hotel Nico Saipan says leasing from the sis sisters would be an awkward agreement. He says the offices in Japan haven't even thought about that possibility. Meanwhile, the Commonwealth Utilities Corporation has hundreds of residential customers demanding justice in district court. The class action suit was initially filed in February by Micronesian Legal Services Corporation on behalf of two unnamed individuals. The lawsuit alleges CUC's failure to give adequate notice to its residential customers prior to disconnection. That violates the U.S. Constitution, the CNMI Constitution, and CUC regulations. Today, U.S. District Court Judge Alex Munson ruled that all those affected are parties in the lawsuit. According to CUC documents, approximately 1,500 residential customers had their electrical power disconnected in the past year. About one-third received no notice prior to the disconnection, 
One third received only 48 hours notice and one third received more than 15 days to pay. Micronesia Legal Services hopes to find more customers who were terminated more than a year ago. A jury trial on this case is set for November. And the Commonwealth Utility Corporation responded to today's proceedings in a media release. CUC Public Information Officer Pamela Mathis wrote that it's been mandated that the CUC operate like a business. Under the regulations, customers who fail to pay their monthly bills are given a 15-day notice, then their utilities are cut off. This also go goes for those on the Low Income Housing and Energy Program. Mathis adds that added to that those who, who are added to the class action suit may find that in the end, they were given their due process. Critical measures before the House of Representatives are still awaiting action. The long-delayed 1993 budget, the Alien Labor Act, and the developer's tax are on the House session's agenda today and are still being debated as we speak. The Alien Labor Act and the developer's tax are important because Governor Larry Guerrero can show the U.S. Congress that the Commonwealth is serious about its reform promises. The 1993 budget is also crucial because it is now in its nine month, into its ninth month and the fiscal year and many programs are in jeopardy. Here's a look at what has happened at the House session thus far. The House of Representatives put forth an aggressive agenda for the remainder of its term. Over 25 bills encompassing a wide range of topics were introduced during the first half of the session, which lasted all morning. A gambling earnings tax, financial and enforcement help for the Department of Immigration, and a lower legal limit of blood alcohol concentration were just some proposals now before the House. A move was also made by Representative Crispin de Leon Guerrero, who offered to rehash the controversial four year ban on alien workers. That proposal seeks to force non-resident workers to leave the Commonwealth for 30 days once they've reached their four-year limit. The bill was met with some resistance. We are just playing uh, games here with uh, amendments to the amendments to the amendments and within the Commonwealth we're being criticized because we tend to, you know, provide a very unstable uh, policy. And this is one good example of that. I really do not see the logic of uh, sending an employee out for 30 days and bringing him or her back again after the 30 days. The only people who are going to suffer are the employers, one. Two, the only people who are going to benefit are the airlines. When the session continued this afternoon, representatives from the public school system showed up to lend their support for a Senate bill that was before the House. It would give PSS more flexibility in hiring and promoting its staff. An interesting piece of legislation was offered by Congressman Heinz Hofschneider. He said that in light of the 702 funding situation, he introduced a bill that would finance various projects around the Commonwealth with $240 million worth of bonds. I'm proposing or introducing a legislation, Mr. Speaker, relating or a bill for an act relating to the general obligations bonds for various public projects. It stipulates a $240 million general obligation bond to address such as the PSS seven year plan of infrastructure needs for the school within the CNMI to a tune of $46 million. And the recent hoopla that we have undergone with uh, CUC relating to contingent liability that imposes another burden on the <coughs> limited resources of this CNMI government. Heated debate took place late in the afternoon on how to act as soon as possible to get over $800,000 in federal funds from Washington, D.C.'s Housing and Urban Development. Mariana Islands Housing Authority would be able to use some of that money to improve Section 8 housing. Some congressmen were fighting to use the rest of those funds for a park in their district. In a conversation I had with House Speaker Tomas Vitsa Gomez almost two hours ago, he said the developer's tax and the Alien Labor Act will likely pass this afternoon. He also said the 93 budget will probably be rejected. And coming up next, a man who threatened a judge and was placed on a million dollar cash bond was released today. We'll tell you why. And bail is set for a second party indicted in a check forgery case. Stay with us. 
A psychiatric evaluation is ordered for a man who threatened Superior Court Judge Alex Castro. Current CPA board member and former Department of Public Works Deputy Director Nick Sablon appeared in district court this afternoon. He was arrested earlier this week by FBI agents for sending interstate threats via fax to Judge Castro. Sablon's lawyer, former Associate Justice Jesus Borja, is representing Sablon and recommended the psychiatric evaluation. Sablon was released to the custody of his brother, David Sablon, on a $10,000 unsecured bond, much less than the $1 million cash bond that he was held on earlier this week. He was ordered to stay away from Judge Castro and any members of Castro's family. A preliminary hearing is scheduled for July 26th. In other court news, the girlfriend of former radio personality Cody Young has turned herself in to Saipan authorities to face theft charges. Josie Martos was wanted in connection with her boyfriend's check forgery case. She allegedly stole two Bank of Guam cashier's checks, which Young opened an account with and withdrew money from. A warrant for Martos' arrest was issued on June 30th while she was off-island in Guam. According to Assistant Attorney General Cheryl Gill, Martos agreed to come to Saipan and appear in court if she were granted a pretrial release. Gill agreed agreed only if an acceptable third-party custodian were appointed. In Martis's bail hearing this morning, Gill interviewed and approved of the two custodians, while Judge Marty Taylor set Martis's bail at $30,000. Martis will be arraigned on Monday. The Hotel Nico Saipan could not get title insurance against Article 12 claims and neither can you. Throughout the week, we've been looking at the unique business of title insurance in the Commonwealth. Tonight, we conclude our series by examining the difficulties in insuring public land. If you have something valuable, you safeguard yourself with insurance. But reducing the risk of buying property is very difficult in the Commonwealth. Pacific American Title Vice President Kim Anderson says Article 12 is not the only exclusion in the company's policies. I mean, there, are, there are other issues like um, Article 11, which is, which is um, not a, a hot potato right now like Article 12 is. But Article 11 is, um, is basically the Homestead Act. Article 11 established the Marianas Public Land Corporation, which administers the Homestead Program. Indigenous residents given land are not allowed to transfer fee simple interest in the property for 10 years. Some of the newer homesteads have um, rules on them, such as you can't um, transfer a, a leasehold interest of more than a year and you can't option out your property. So but we're getting pretty tight on homesteads. However, in a decade, homestead recipients can sell their property or a buyer can purchase the parcel with the assurance of title insurance. After that 10-year period, it's fine for you to sell the property. So we say, of course, we'll insure against that because it's fine for you to do it. Title insurance affects everyone. And title insurance affects the stability of the economic marketplace. What do the Saipan Police Academy just completed their self-defense classes today. The police cadets are now three and a half weeks away from their internship program. During the seven months of preparation as becoming, becoming a police officer, um, is learning self-defense is part of the major training program. Frank Lizama, the chief trainer from Guam, talks about the learning process. Learning, learning how to defend themselves against an attack that was their face, their chest area, their groin area. Behind. Later on, when they, when they do the forms, that we teach them how to defend themselves to 360 degrees. Basically, what I like to see here is that they go away with the learning how to uh, specialize in the three basic blood, which is the low, middle, and high blood. If they master that, okay, they can actually develop their own techniques to make that better. So, what kind of fighting? It's, uh, we, we call it, uh, you know, <laughs> Uh, it's a combination of all the arts, but uh, I call it myself a street defense. Willie, do you know any martial arts? No, I don't, Glenn. I wish I could learn some, though. Could be helpful in hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat somehow, somewhere. That's yeah, right. yeah, exactly. Well, the Saipan All-Stars will represent CNMI in the Far East Tournament, and we got highlights in Major League Baseball. Major League All-Star Game is next week, but here in the Northern Marianas, our All-Star Little Leaguers competed for the right to represent CNMI in the Far East Tournament. And what should have been a three-day event only lasted two days. The Tinian All-Stars pitted their skills against the Saipan All-Stars, which had seven players from the League Champion Aces. The Saipan All-Stars garnered the right to play in the Far East Tournament by beating the Tinian All-Stars two games straight. 
District Administrator for the Little League, Congressman Tony Camacho, had this to say at the presentation of the trophies in San Vicente. And we are looking forward to the uh, Far East Regional Tournament 1993 to be held here on the 25th up to the August 5th. And as you know, uh, Saipan All-Stars uh, got the right to uh, represent us. The Shinamai uh, you know, will be representing by Saipan All-Stars. I hope that uh, next year uh, the Saipanian will work hard to try to uh, compete with uh, the Saipan. The Little League raffle has been rescheduled to July 17 at the Tudela Court in San Vicente at 7 p.m. And just because we're done doesn't mean you have to change the channel. Stay tuned for news in Chamorro, Asuto Siente with Mina Dela Cruz as our host. And right after that, you can catch a program entitled The Guterres Controversy. Did the media cross the line? It's an examination on, on how Guam's media reported on alleged sexual misconduct by Senator Carl Guterres. The half-hour video was put together by Dr. J. Fred McDonald, a leading authority on the impact of media on culture. On behalf of the entire KMCV News team, thanks for joining us. Have a great weekend, and we'll see you here again Monday night. Good night. Good night. Good night.